Hi, good afternoon and welcome to our Coeo Fundamentals webinar. This is a webinar discussing five signs that you need a data strategy. Today I'm joined with uh, by James and Dave. Um, Dave is our data strategy expert and James is our sales and marketing director. Um, I'll just hand over to James and Dave for a quick introduction. Thank you, Comal. Hi, everyone. As Comal said, I'm James Booth, the Sales and Marketing Director. I've been with Curio for about 11 years now, um, and I've had a passion for data pretty much the whole way through my career. Started out as um, a software developer, then architect, um, and then had quite a lot of experience at Curio um, advising clients on the direction that they should uh, take their uh, data practice within their business. I'm delighted to be joined by Dave today, who is a subject matter expert in um, designing and building data strategies. So um, Dave, would you like to just share a little bit about your background so the audience gets to know you a little bit too? No problem, will do. Um, hello all, uh, I'm Dave Shepherd, data strategy specialist at Curio. Um, been working with Curio just over a year now, um, but my, my data journey goes slightly further back. It's now been 30 years, so back in 92, I was a junior DBA, so I feel very old and fragile, but along the way, built up um, an, an exciting career, um, mostly focused in data strategy, helping organisations just understand uh, where they are in their data journey, how to move that forwards, and really just um, helping unlock the value of data. And obviously data as a as a concept and as a technology has changed massively as well. And it's just been a really exciting um, you know, career to, to have in this, this type of area. And uh, look forward to speaking with you all. Amazing. Thanks so much for your introductions. I'm really excited about today's topic of five signs you need a data strategy. Um, so I'm Komal. I'm a marketing manager here at Coeo. And this year we're launching um, a series of webinars that every month we'll talk about different topics such as analytics, data technologies, and today we're talking about data strategy. So I'm going to hand the conversation over to Dave and James, um, who will take you through the content. Thank you so much. Thanks, Cobble. So let's move on to the first sign that we need a data strategy. Um, and the first sign that we um, recognise with clients that we're working with is that um, the clients are talking about data. Dave, this seems a little bit counterintuitive because surely he's talking about data is a good sign. <laughs> you would think so, um, but I ironically not. Um, quite often many organisations get caught in a trap where if they're like relatively low in their data maturity, then a lot of their daily, weekly, monthly problems are about getting the data. So as we're almost implying here, it's like the mechanics or the vehicle of getting the data and less focus on, well, what's the actual business outcome that we're trying to solve here? And as a result, the kind the conversation tends to be tilted to more around, well, what data have we been given? And from that data, what decisions can we make? As opposed to ideally the opposite, which would be, Here's our customer problem, whether it's, I don't know, customer retention or growing profits or saving some costs and then saying, so what data do we need to support this instead? So this tends to really be around if you're finding yourself talking about data, as in you're talking about the mechanics of how you get data from places and how you share that around, then that's quite systematic of um, you know this this scenario where you're focusing more on how you get the data than actually what you need it for. So that's a really good point because I think lots of businesses have built a cottage industry of data collection and manipulation. Um, where would you see these pains come from when you're looking at a new business that you're talking to Dave? It can come in, a, I guess, a, num a number of ways. Like the key one really is, and I mean, it's quite often it's just because businesses, when they naturally just start to grow and they're scaling up and they're getting more customers, then how they adapt to their data, it, it's quite manual in that initial uh, stages. So quite often they build a dependency on maybe um, a couple of key people who know how to get this data maybe. And so it ends up being some manual process and this dependency on people to start pulling that together. 
and nobody really takes time at the beginning to say, well, maybe we need to like build a proper automated workflow or something for this. You, you don't think that way in the beginning. It's very much around, well, what can we do just to, you know, to, to get the data out of some of these systems that we've got and start to start to look at it. And so you end up with this situation where you quite often have people who end up being, you know, needed on weekends and, you know, and, you know, and nights who are responsible for pulling all this data together for you. Um, and it's really, that's the first sign of this trap almost that, that you're, you're starting to focus too much on the data. Yeah, and I think I've seen similar scenarios where the data collection has been a very technical led operation. Um, and that can then introduce um, that real focus on the mechanics of the data rather than thinking more holistically about what the purpose of that data is and what benefit that that's going to drive. So if you yeah. are beginning to see that, are there some ways that you can work to resolve those types of issue within the organisation? Yeah, there are. I think the, the real the real first thing that you need to do is to really almost like not detach yourself from the data, but like you know, time out and say, what's actually the outcome that we're trying to achieve here? And again, it shouldn't even be based on just that data you've got. You know, just thinking irrespective of, of any of the data that you, that you actually are receiving at the moment, what's that end business outcome that you're trying to achieve? And ideally, what's the piece of actual insight that you would ideally have presented to you that gives you all the insight and functionality and drill through to be able to address that that business outcome start with that even though it may be that the data is difficult to achieve or even if you don't know how that's the question you've got to start with and you can't be throttled back by what data is available you must start with um, the outcome that you're trying to achieve and work back from that that's a great, great piece of advice. And I think, you know, um, there's the famous Stephen Covey quote of start with the end in mind, and that will help free you from thinking about the mechanics, but really think about what you're trying to achieve. And then you can start thinking about what data you actually need to assemble in order to be able to get to that tip, uh, that outcome that you're trying to drive. That will also help protect you um, from having key personnel dependencies as well, because I think that's a common scenario and trap that you can fall into um, if everything is um, produced in a very manual process. Are there ways to really work to avoid falling into that typical trap? Yeah, I mean, quite often you almost need to be in it to, I guess, to spot it. But it's really, like you say, if you have a dependency on key people and there are ways in which you're recognising the data that maybe you do need in support of some of those outcomes, it's looking at ways in which you can start to build workflows and automation to actually get that data automatically. So that's not the focus, so again, of the of the actual engine or the mechanics of how you're getting the data. Let's automate that and then turn the focus into we need to take this raw data and how do we then transform it to actually meet those actionable insight requirements so it can actually then answer the business outcome that it needs to. Fantastic, that sounds really good. So I think we're probably at a point where um, we can wrap up this tell because I think you've um, shared a lot of really valuable insight um, there. So obviously there are some particular signposts that you need to be looking out for in this particular area. Um, we did cover it very briefly, but um, quality of data is also an area that you do need to be looking at to make sure that um, you're not putting lots of manual corrections into the data later and you've got people that have responsibility for ensuring the data that's been entered into systems within your organisation is fit for purpose and you're meeting the uh, needs that you've got for the analysis that you want to do on that data later. Um, you need to move the conversation from being about the mechanics of collecting the data, often a very technical conversation about how you'd extract particular data sets from particular source systems into a business outcomes conversation. What is it that you want to achieve with that data? Um, and then think about how you're actually going to collect that and automate those processes to prevent those key person dependencies 
around it. And that leads on nicely to um, removing those isolated manual um, data preparation activities. You know, I've seen lots of organisations with uh, cottage industries of data preparation within them. Um, a big sign of this is lots of Excel being used throughout the organisation because that's typically a scenario where data is being extracted out of source systems, managed on the on the desk. Um, and then presented back to stakeholders within the business. And again, you've got ungoverned, unmanaged um, scenarios there. Um, and then just thinking about, are the right people having the right access to the right data at the right time? Um, and if that is the case, then you're probably um, moving on from this um, particular uh, pain. But if you are seeing those types of problems, that's a great um, indicator that you need to um, work um, on your data strategy and make sure that that aligns to what you're trying to achieve. So let's move on to the next sign now, which is around um, in, uh, insight based on applications, not on business outcomes. And um, I think this could be uh, seen as very much being a vendor led problem um, because um, every um, IT system that I've had to acquire in my previous lives before I uh, worked at Curio tried to sell me the panacea on the reporting that they would produce me from that line of business application. Um, would you agree with that, Dave? Hundred uh, percent. I mean, it's again, it, it's um, a situation that people can very easily find themselves in, where they're, they're sold that vision, and you know, quite rightly, for a lot of operational. Uh, purposes, the reports that come out of that particular application are fit for purpose because it's immediate reporting around an immediate functional need to, you know, to, to provide a, a particular set of output that you need. But the problem is it's when you're trying to think in a wider sense because you'll have a, you know, you have multiple business teams. Each of those will have business processes which have got you know, like multiple layers to it, which may need to touch multiple different systems at different parts of the journey. So when you start talking about reporting from just one application, you are completely limiting that business that business view just from both from the, from the teams that they use it and also how much of the business processes that it fulfills. And it very rarely gives you that end-to-end -end view. So if you say, oh, if you've got that Salesforce report, it may be that you need to understand customer profitability. That's partly from your CRM and maybe partly from your finance system to actually look at the underlying cost to acquire or the cost to serve a particular client. And so by only looking in these, these silos of, uh, of applications, then it can be quite limiting to, the, to the, the business value that you actually get from those reports. Yeah, and I think this can often also create some tension between users and departments as well, because they're looking at the data in the sphere of the individual application that they primar primarily um, work with, whereas we want to create a harmon harmonious view of the data across the business. Um, how do you go from having very specific operational reporting to um, being able to report effectively across functions? So I think the one one of the key things you need to do, and again, it's almost listening for how you're talking about this, is try and catch yourself every time you're talking about the application where the data is coming from. And that we need to try and really like nip, nip in the bud, because again, that's a sign almost similar to the first tell. It's a sign that we're limiting ourselves based on something being provided to us as opposed to actually what we want. And in order to really do that, what's really quite uh, useful to do is to really think about how ideally you'd like to see that data. So irrespective of the systems that you use as a business, how do you want to see your data? What's that underlying vocabulary that you use? Some of the terminology that's specific to you that you wouldn't necessarily see in your applications, you know, all of that nomenclature and how you really want to see your information ideally being presented. It's about thinking of your requirements in terms of that as a model rather than how the different applications are producing reports for you. And that's the first real step to, to achieving that. But again, it's sort of elevating your thought process up from individual point solutions to 
of what are we trying to achieve as a business and then how do we get the information that we need to know what our performance is against those um, key measures or metrics that we want to be holding ourselves accountable to. Yes, uh, like I said before, you know, a lot of the terminology within your business, you can't truly articulate just from one system. You know, profitability might be sales from one system and cost from another. So it's really just trying to, you know, and that's obviously a really oversimplified example, but it's it's trying to think that way. And then you can start to do that mapping of what data do we need from what silos, from what applications, so that in order to give us that overall single view of, of the of the insight ideally that we need. When you've been working with organizations in this area, have you come across any resistance in moving from looking at that very application led um, data provision to a more um, organization wide solution? And if so, how have you overcome that? type of challenge so you, you do you do find it i guess the, the scenario can vary but you know i guess the, the worst or the you know, the the most um common example is where there is a business function whose all their insight needs are completely fulfilled by one application and they'll have absolutely zero appetite to do anything else because they're almost trusting it at source they don't want to then see that combined with other things you know, and so that's typically a challenge where they are just so um, you know, entrenched with that application based view, um, but they arguably have no value to actually understand the bigger, wider piece. So that's more maybe more of an edge case, um, but it is around just trying to build that trust of saying, you know, a single business aligned view is going to be different to what the source systems are telling us because we will transform it into our business view. But the end goal and the end benefits of it are going to be far more reaching. It's going to cover the end-to-end -end view of the business. It's not going to be limited in any area. And then it's just about how you bring those users along with the journey and start exposing them, getting them involved. So all their requirements are particularly covered as well. And then that's how we really start to build that, that trust in that journey. Brilliant, that's great. Let's um, wrap up this um, sign now. So um, obviously, um, the sign is insight based on applications, not based on business outcomes and um, some signals or some pains that you might experience are reports are um, limited to application by application um, delivery. So um, you end up with very fragmented silos of information within your organization and users can't see holistically across your business. They can only see the reference from the application that they're primarily working with. Um, you also get partial insight um, that does not cover the end to end business requirement. Um, so that you can move beyond that, but you need to start looking at a business centric approach, start gathering what your actual business requirements are for uh, reporting across the business, then start looking at how you're going to assemble that data to be able to provide that holistic view bring that data in from those um, disparate uh, data sources within your organization and bring them together to break down um, the silos of data. Um, you need to aspire towards a single model across your whole business, which will allow you to have an end to end view of um, the business processes that you're operating, but also create some consistency in your vocabulary and terminology. This will go a long way to ensuring that everyone within your business has a better understanding um, and focus on their overall performance um, against what you're trying to achieve as an organization. Great, so let's move on to the next tell now. Um, and this possibly is the favorite, my favorite image. It does actually look like that's a braided USB cable in this picture as well. So I love the fact that technology is even brought into uh, this particular image that we've chosen here. Um, Dave, would you like to just talk about the shiny ball syndrome? Because it may not have been um, a term that people are familiar with. No problem, and agreed on the image. Um, even though I'm more of a dog person than a cat person, it is a, <laughs> a very, very good image. So the the um, 
I guess the, the problem with describing shiny ball syndrome is that it, it's a very, you know, it's a, a very compelling thing to do. It's a very admirable thing that people try to do with the best intentions, but ultimately end up with um, a, a difficult situation. So this is where, and especially in the data world, again, with the rest of IT as well, there are opportunities to explore and use new technical approaches. There's always some new innovations with data about how it can be ingested, the types of sources we can use, what we can do with the manipulation of that data as well. And so it can be very easy to get very caught up with the excitement of something that we can do very, very quickly. And that's very, very exciting. And also it can get the business very, very excited about it as well. But it ends up being something that's maybe done in isolation and maybe it's just within one team. And then when you say, well, is this now a supportable data product or an approach that we can use? We realize that it hasn't been built with very good governance. It wasn't built as a known project team. We're now reliant on you know one or two key individuals as opposed to this being like a proper project within the business that's being supported. And it may not even be aligned to underlying business strategy or IT strategy or you know hopefully going forward to data strategy. And so it's it's just about being wary that it's there's lots of great opportunity out there to build very exciting, cool new things. But there is, especially with data, the need just to think of that more boring, arguably, but important underlying governance and management about how you go about building those. I just want to be really clear here and um, be and just state the obvious, which is you're not saying that we shouldn't be innovating. Um, and <laughs> uh, and um, well, I think the, the big difference here is um, there are some fantastic um, industry led innovations going on within data that we can take advantage of. But the key message I hear from you is that that to benefit from that innovation, it must align to what you're trying to achieve as an organization. And if it's just developed for the sake of trying out a new technology, then that's going to fail and that's not going to get deliver you any um, tangible benefit that um, will uh, be of use to the organization. So the key thing here in my mind is um, being very clear what you're trying to achieve as an organization and then finding the right product services and solutions that you can innovate on that's going to drive that change that you want to achieve. No, absolutely. Yes, I mean, it's, um, I mean, 100% around the need for innovation. Yeah, absolutely. But it, it's just, as you say, it's that more measured approach and just making sure that there's some basics that are being checked as part of that um, to make sure that we are aligning with the underlying goals um, and strategy of the business. And also if there's like some of the underlying methodologies about how this is undertaken as a, as a project and then how it's moved into like a support structure. It's just making sure that all of those boxes are also ticked as well so that it's actually going to be, you know, a useful innovation that's you know come from somewhere, but actually gets properly embedded as a supported value adding ongoing data product or, or business process, um, as opposed to being like some tactical thing that you don't have to support. Yeah, and I think we see um, the term grey IT referred to quite a bit, um, which is essentially where um, individuals or uh, business units or departments have um, realised that they have a need, but this hasn't been um, dealt with in a strategic approach. So point solutions have been discovered by individuals um, and then you end up with um, disparity of solution across the overall business. Is that something that you've come across, Dave? And if you have, what, how would you approach resolving those? Because people become quite territorial quite quickly. But they do. And I guess disparity between systems or technology and also like repositories of data, the there may be a valid need for it you know, in, in certain instances, but it can quite often actually go against the underlying economies of scale within the business. So you, you end up, I mean, let's take the obvious one. If you're buying lots of different technologies, which arguably are doing similar things, but in different departments or countries, then you may be missing out on lots of commercial 
economies of scale if you're like licensing lots of different technologies. Um, so sometimes, you know, again, the innovation with the best intention growing in different areas ends up with a lack of that uh, commercial um, economic scale. The other one aside that as well is more than the people side of it. So the more different technologies you have, the more different skills you may need. And so you don't have a standard skill base that you can link to all your learning and development programs. And you end up with either the need for hybrid people who understand all these things, which are probably quite hard to actually you know, find and resource and keep, or you have this uh, like almost like specialization of skills. And so you end up needing more people to be involved as you follow the data through these business processes as it crosses all these different technologies. Yeah, and I suppose that then leads on to um, risk around compliance and governance as well because um, you've lost the control over the data and the platforms at that point. Is that um, again a scenario that you've come across Dave? Um, it, it can be and again if if there are different technical solutions, different underlying architectures that you know data architecture to the security arch architecture layer, you know if they're all processing and handling data differently then you do run the risk um, more from you know, again that information governance perspective that you have inconsistency in how you're approaching your data you know and that's of critical importance that when you look at some of your underlying data policies you know how you approach um, data related legislation that the more consistency you can have in that space the better. Brilliant that's some um, very clear um, guidance on um, the problem itself and then how to address um, the problem that we do encounter from time to time in organizations that we meet. So I'll just summarize um, around that. So signs of this problem are um, isolation within parts of the business, um, localized um, domain knowledge that's not shared um, throughout the organization, um, technology that's not easily accessible or transferable in that you've got um, very specific um, applications that are doing a similar activity across um, different parts of the business and storing their data in um, different proprietary ways that make it difficult um, for users to access and then to um, be able to make decisions based on um, not necessarily aligning to the IT strategy and therefore um, have it creating a risk of governance and um, not aligning to best practice um, and uh, reducing the economy of scale that you could be achieving as an organization both uh, commercially um, technically um, and also from a human resource perspective as well because obviously um, the more technology you bring into the organization the more um, intellectual capacity is required from the uh, people within your organization to actually get make use of these um, solutions um, and then because you've ended up with um, lots of different technologies at play you go back to the earlier problems that we were discussing around not having um, a holistic view of that data and it being um, siloed within applications or data stores. So there's some um, resolutions that we can look for um, toward this and that um, really um, comes to making sure that you've got um, a, a IT strategy that aligns to what you're trying to achieve as a business that you're looking for opportunities to um, get the best possible economies of scale by strategically deploying um, company-wide um, IT systems and solutions, that you're building um, your analytics platform to um, look across all of those um, technologies so that you've got one standardized um, approach to managing and uh, reporting on that data. Um, and that you're leveraging the skills of the organization, building learning plans around the technologies that you're deploying strategically so that um, your people are making the most out of those platforms and they're on a continual improvement process with them um, and that you can then actually become more agile in the way that you're delivering both IT services and data services within the organization. Let's move on to the next sign now, which is the sunk cost fallacy. Um, this is quite an interesting one and um, can be quite contentious because when people have made 
a big investment in a technology and if they then realize that it's not necessarily the right future direction for the organization there can be a bit of a loss of face um, that <laughs> you have to accept um, but if we look at the problem and um, don't blame individuals then we can work to overcome this particular scenario but essentially what we're saying here is that we may well have invested heavily in a particular technology or solution um, but times have moved on the business has moved on and that may not be the right future direction for us to move in whilst <laughs> we have spent a lot of time effort and money on that solution that's not necessarily the best direction for us to go in um, Dave, I think that kind of summarises the uh, fallacy, but um, from your experience where you've seen this at play, um, what are the other typical signs that you've come across and um, what have you um, done to um, approach those particular issues within an organisation? OK, I mean, the, the, the key thing really, I think, here is the, the the data journey, the the, you know, the investment you make in data is quite often very different you know, initially to the to the investment you might make in your new IT infrastructure or your CRM system or your finance system, where it's like RFP driven. It's quite clear what you want. You've got a whole bunch of requirements, and you know you make those decisions and you kind of stick with them, and they're largely correct. And then you review as the investment goes on. With data, it tends to be more of a slow burn, where it's it's as you grow, I mentioned earlier, as you grow organically, you find that there's more and more data that you need and somebody starts putting some reports together. And before you know it, you've like chosen a particular technology and you've grown some dependency on it. And quite often organisations do grow in that way as opposed to as a concerted um, decision to, to you know, make that investment. So quite often it's been that slow burn that organisations have found themselves in where they have built something up over many years which has taken lots of either direct cost or indirect cost because the teams who they you know, who they employ have been building that up and it's when you're at that point where you've realized that you know just with the best intentions you haven't been able to build it to scale to be strategic to meet the further growth and needs of the business and it's at that point where you realize well how do we either go from here and invest and make the decision correct whereas sometimes it needs more of a course correction approach to say you know it's it's not about trying to leverage all of that sunk cost it's saying where are we now what's the best decision we can make at this stage and that really is one of the key like nervousness that we see with with clients where it's like well if we do a data strategy then we might find out that we were wrong and it's not a case of being wrong it's about saying based on how you've grown and where you've got to now irrespective of the history of that investment it's what's the best decision to do now and how best to move forwards. Yeah, that's great. And I think a lot of this comes around um, being confident and actually being data driven about what the benefit moving forward is of the money that's been invested so far and the time and, and um, effort invested so far, um, and what the outcome is likely to be from that, and then what the alternative options are and then what the outcomes are likely to be from those. And if you can then get that uh, quantified, then you're able to um, be able to um, objectively compare the different options that are available to you. Yes, and not only that, look at those in terms of options, but really understand, I guess, from an investment perspective, whether it's CapEx or OpEx and, and you know the team involvement is, well, what's that? what's that short term hill you've got to climb an investment maybe you need now but understanding what that long term reward is going to be you know strategically how you're setting yourself up for the future it lets you really see that clear you know multi year view of the benefit case in support of the you know investment decisions you need to make yeah and i think that's some really good advice because um, ultimately, you're going to need to be having a conversation with senior stakeholders within the organisation at this point and being able to clearly present um, how those investment decisions will benefit the organisation and what the risks and the benefits are of each of those helps those individuals make a considered 
decision. So I'll just wrap this one up now. Um, the signs that you're really looking for here are that um, the business has invested heavily in a solution. They're not necessarily seeing the outcomes that they were hoping for from that solution, or maybe the business has moved on or the technology has moved on in such a way. There are other approaches that could now be taken that weren't necessarily available at the time that the decision was made as well. And this is why I think it's really important to look at the problem and not to blame individuals that have been involved in any decision making that's gone on because typically people are trying to make the best decisions based on the information that's available at the time. Another sign is that the capex or opex that has been consumed by this um, service or solution have not produced the results that are expected. Um, perhaps the original project has gone significantly over budget um, and therefore there's been a tendency just to keep putting more and more in, hoping the right outcome will be achieved in the end. Um, or um, the solution worked well for the organisation for a while, but as the business has scaled, as the, as the, um, the, the size of the um, workload has scaled, um, the solution hasn't been able to scale with it and therefore there are performance and um, availability issues. So the first thing um, in order to resolve this is actually just recognising that there may be a problem here um, and being able to identify the sunk cost fallacy is your first step. Then start moving on to separate um, the money and the effort that's already been invested versus what's what the potential opportunity is um, and what, <laughs> for um, this particular option and and then start thinking about um, what options there are to course correct. So moving on to our last sign um, on in today's webinar, we're going to talk about how culture eats um, strategy for breakfast, which again seems like a slightly ironic um, so, um, tell to be talking about. Obviously it's for the famously quoted by Peter Drucker, uh, the management consultant um, who has uh, provided lots of insight to many business leaders over the years. Perhaps, Dave, you could um, expand on this and explain why this is an important sign uh, for people to be looking for if they believe or if they think there might be a need for a data strategy. No, we'll do. I mean, it's uh, the, the way I think it's probably widely regarded in industry, but also how you know we as Curio approach this within the data strategy framework that we use. There are three main broad brush areas. There's like the technology of of uh, data and how you need to address it. There's all the governance and process side, which you've alluded to a little bit. But the third and equally uh, as important piece is around the culture of data. There's no point trying to build a solution which again you know, might be technically brilliant in in all regards. But if you don't get the buy-in from the right people, you don't get the acceptance of it as a solution, especially if it's been compared to a prior solution and there may be changes to it in terms of how it's been done or levels of automation or even like the outputs that are being produced. If it won't get culturally adopted, then it doesn't matter how good the solution is, ultimately it won't be used and that's going to be to the detriment of the business. So it's really around some of the key things to look for and some of the almost like like nudging that we need to do in different parts of the organization to help drive the correct data culture as and when you maybe are going on this type of data journey. Great advice, Dave. And th I'm sure there'll be scenarios that you've been in where there have been competing solutions or technologies within um, different uh, business areas within the organization. Obviously, we want the business to culturally align around a strategic implementation or solution. Um, from your experience, how have you um, worked to achieve that um, cultural alignment within the organization? So, I mean, there's a number of ways in which you need to do it, and maybe there are a number of scenarios. It might be worthwhile touching on them first, just about how this comes about. So it might be that, like I've said, you know, in some of the examples earlier, you're just an organization that's starting to grow and you need to harden or reinvest in some of the this new technology and there may just be people who are just set on the old approach and you know they'll just be resistant to change technically or procedurally because it might be a direct impact on them or it may take them out of their comfort zone 
in terms of the type of technology, or it may be, I mean, it, we see this commonly if there's like other joint ventures or big reorganizations as well, where quite often there are those types of disruptions going on and it can cause that, you know, like unsettling really um, in terms of, you know, how people will adapt new reporting and new data in, in those different scenarios. So it's really about how how to try and shift some of that um, that culture, which really comes down to a lot with um, accountability. And it has to be at a number of different layers. So at that high level within the organization, you need that senior um, buy-in from the exec down in terms of the sponsorship behind these types of initiatives. But also equally as important, that, that senior layer, you need to start establishing what we would call like business data ownership. So not in terms of, oh, it's just within finance, therefore it's a finance issue, but it's trying to actually start to look at data as, as an actual business concept and saying for all the different parts of it, who should really be owning and being maybe a custodian of that to help make sure that we drive the right initi initiatives forward. But then also if there are data quality issues or data governance concerned, we've got like a, a stakeholder or a custodian who's going to be owning those things. They can't necessarily solve them all, but it's actually somebody to take that accountability within the business as opposed to, oh, it's in that system, I don't look after it. Um, and then more of the lower layer of the organization and arguably the most important piece, it's all of that cultural adoption throughout the actual organization. So it's about giving demonstrable results and experiences for people about that new approach and to say, you know, as a result of a strategy, here's what can now be done. So it's not just telling people it has to be done, but it's about giving people an, a chance to experience it for themselves and almost through their own discovery, see how it's going to be of value to them and then support them with the, the right learning and development um, programs for, like, say, their data literacy to make sure they have all the right technical skills in place to actually then start to use that new insight that they can start to adopt on, you know, in, a, in a more structured approach on their own. Yeah, and I think there's a great lens to look at this is um, for all of the uh, roles that you're going to be interacting with across the business, start thinking about what's in it for me, um, because there will be a benefit for that individual for taking on this program. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing it. But if we can think of it for each of the roles, then we can then position why this change is coming about how that impacts them in a positive and maybe a negative way in the in the short term, because there's often some pain that needs to be gone through in a transitionary period, but really under, help the individuals understand the purpose of the change um, and how they can best embrace it and adopt it to get the most value out of the change that's coming. I think we're pretty mm -hmm. much coming close to time on this and I know you and I could be talking about this all day but I will sum this one up now so um, obviously there are some clear signs that you can be looking for here that um, to make sure that the culture of data has the right level of consideration within the business it's quite common for IT projects to really focus on the technology um, but we do need to be considering the culture and governance alongside that with equal weighting um, make sure that we've built strong support and ownership throughout the organization, starting from the exec all the way through to uh, business leaders within the organization, down to end users that are going to be consuming the services that are going to be um, adopted. Um, make sure that we've got data specific teams within the organization that are really championing the change and providing the support that um, users are going to need and build a community around um, this change to make sure that you can create momentum and support the users in the change that is coming. You can do that by um, actively assessing what the uh, cultural impact of the change program is likely to be. Uh, build in change management into um, the approach that you're taking, making sure that you've got buy-in um, from the users, from the uh, leaders and from the exec, and make sure that you've got a good management program in place to um, support the um, upskilling of um, the team within the organisation. This will all help you lead your teams towards um, adopting this new approach and getting the maximum benefit from it. 
they were all the tales we were going to share today. Thank you ever so much, Dave, for providing that great insight and experience that you've got um, from dealing with these scenarios in organisations over many years of experience. Um, I'll hand over to Comal now, who can just wrap up where we've got to. Amazing. Thanks so much for walking us through that content, Dave and James. Really insightful. And I'm sure so many of those tells will resonate with our audience today. Um, just to mention, if you do have um, any need or anything has struck a chord with you and you'd like to carry on the conversation, we've got our client managers and also experts like Dave and James on hand, ready to have a conversation with you. Um, I think everything that we've heard so far, um, it's definitely a journey and data strategy is not just something that we talk about at a point in time. It is living, it grows and it evolves. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and um, we'll be happy to take any questions if you if you have them. I'm, I'm happy to stay on the line for a few minutes just so that we can get any questions from the members. Uh, on the line and next month we'll be having uh, another COEO Fundamentals webinar. We'll be talking about artificial intelligence and you can sign up to that at the forward slash events website.